E benvenuti anche questa volta a un caffè con jspark.it. Eh, questa volta siamo veramente davvero onorati dei due ospiti che ci accompagnano, due grandi interpreti bacchiani, due grandi performer, ma anche una vera e propria famiglia bacchiana. So once again we welcome to, to our new episode of Coffee uh, with jspark.it and we are delighted to welcome today two great musicians, Tama Halperin and uh, Andreas Schroen. Tamar Halperin studied piano and harpsichord in Tel Aviv, Basel and New York. In 2009, she received a doctoral degree from the Juilliard School, having written a dissertation on Bach. Tamar was awarded the Hessische Kulturpreis 2016 and recorded for labels such as Decca, Neos, Neue Meister and ACT, including the two-time Echo Award-winning Bundeskammer with Michael Volny. Her childhood was spent training to be a professional tennis player. Now she lives with her husband and four-year-old daughter in a small village. Why Andreas Scholl is a German musician, international active as a contratenor, composer, etc. He has won numerous awards and prizes, including the prestigious Echo Awards, and for his composition for Deutsche Grammophon's audiobook of Hans Christian Andersen's Fairy Tales. Andreas has released a series of extraordinary solo recordings, the most recent being Twilight People, and an album of four songs in new arrangements, together with his wife, the pianist, Tama Halperi. Among the many others, we would like to see the recording of Bach's cantatas with the Kammer Orchestra Basel, um, and the many opera by Handel and the sacred and secular work by the greatest masters of the Baroque area. His website is www.andreasscholl.org. So welcome, so welcome once more and thanks for accepting our invitation. It's an honor. It's nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we have the habit of asking a personal question first. Could you both share with us a special memory linked to Bach and to his music? Well, um, to be honest, the, the music of Bach goes through almost all my memories. So there are a few memories that are not somehow linked to Bach. But one memory that is particularly important for me uh, took place about five years ago when I was pregnant with our daughter. I was six months pregnant and playing continuo for the B minor mass. Uh, where Andreas was singing the canto tenor solo. We were in Denmark in a beautiful, beautiful, huge cathedral in Aarhus. And the continuo, the cembalo and the organ were positioned just at the end of the orchestra in front of the choir. So I was in the punct in the middle of all the voices and all the strings. And I had the best acoustics of my life in this beautiful church. And I could feel the baby kicking when, wow. when, the, or when the choir was singing. And during rehearsal, it was already very strong. But then in the concert, I really had the feeling that the music was so powerful and the harmony in the sense, in the basic sense of just people together was so, so, so strong that this huge, massive building, this big cathedral with 1,500 people in the audience were just floating in the air. It was so, such a strong, strong, strong experience. And I remember thinking that I was very happy for this little life inside my stomach to have this, these experience as a, their first sounds because I thought, I don't know if I can get any better than this. So... Yeah, it was amazing. Wow. <laughs> For me, I, I sang Bach already in the boys' choir. And I think my, one of the earliest and most profound memories is uh, the, us with the boys' choir preparing the Johannes Passion from Bach. And uh, this is something difficult for children. I mean, you, we, we started, I don't I think probably after the summer break, we started preparing for uh, St. John's Passion in uh, spring the following year. 
So you, you virtually need a long breath. There's no instant gratification for the children if you really want to work on such a one. Well, there are more monumental pieces by Bach, but for us that was what, was, what we could do. And uh, I enjoyed singing in the choir a lot because around me, all other boys were doing the same. It's like, it's mm -hmm. we're a team. It's a different way of thinking uh, of yourself as a singer if you, if you come from a boys' choir. You, you don't think you are any special because around you, 30 other boys do the same thing that you do. So it, it's very healthy. And then there was this long period of, of preparation, preparation. And we knew there would be the concert. And the deep moment was the final choral, Ach, Herr, lass deine lieben Engelein, when there's the line, Herr Jesu Christ, erhöre mich, erhöre mich, ich will dich preisen ewiglich. Lord Jesus Christ, listen to me, I want to pray to you eternally. And I swear that these boys and me at the age of 12, probably, we almost shouted this with religious fanatism. And there is not, not, not much religion in the boys choir. I mean, we have no religious lessons, nothing. But we felt the power of the moment. We were aware what the piece was about. And we prepared like for more than half a year for this moment. And it was... Um, I, I always claim now that we grasped the music. Children cannot understand Bach, it's too complex. But in Germany, we have these two words, to grasp, begreifen, and verstehen, to understand. And I think understanding is one thing. It's an analyzation. You come up with a result. And grasp means you receive something in its entirety without analyzation, and you understand it on an intuitive level. And later on, when I thought about it, because frequently people ask, so how can children sing Bach's music? And how did Bach do this with his boy sopranos? And, and I think if you decide, if you distinguish between grasping and understanding, I think, yes, these children back then and children today are able to, uh, to grasp Bach's music and to be in the moment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, wow. Um, very touched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and really, fun, uh, two great, great memories. And we continue with the, these relationships between children and the family and Bach. Since uh, Mr. and Mrs. Scholl, you're a couple and you both share the love of music and particularly of Bach's music. And you have even recording an album dedicated to your little daughter. And in fact, music can be a great gift of love. And Bach himself knew a thing or two about family and education. And how do you think that Bach's music may help the education of a children and to express the sense of family or of love and so on? To you both. <laughs> uh, um, what comes to my mind is um, um, I, I make a little detour and then I, I answer your question. So, um, in the Goldberg Variations, which happens to be one of the very few few pieces that Bach actually published, it's actually the only one, but it's you know there has many parts. Yeah. So, in the Goldberg Variations, um, there are the thirty variations, and they are structured in a certain particular way. And the last variation is an exception to everything that comes before. It's a short variation and the title is Quadlibet. And Quadlibet means taking one song or actually taking a few songs and singing them in canon so they fit together. And this is what Bach did also in the Goldberg variation. He put a couple of student songs of the time on the base, base line of the Goldberg variation. But then when I saw it, um, I was actually very touched because I remember seeing in the Bach biography that before Bach's parents passed away, when he was very young, he was 10 years old when they, his parents died. Before they died, they had a huge household where the father was a music teacher, so they had music students living in the house and all the brothers and sisters. And once a year, the entire fam uh, Bach family would come from all over Germany and Hungary to get together. And what they did on these occasions is sing quarterly bits. So they would just take the pop songs of the time and just sing them in canon. 
uh, and this was probably his, uh, uh, this is my interpretation now, but I imagine that this was his memory of family and home and music making together. And I think it's very touching to think that for this monumental piece of the Goldberg variation, and so much has been said about it and the analysis goes endlessly, it's so amazing, but that the last, last, last moment of it is this little greeting from um, the past, from the Bach family singing together the songs. And this is now to answer your question. I think the sense of harmony, again, because of many different things that fit together in the counterpoint. Bach is the master of counterpoint. So whereas, let's say, other composers have melody and accompaniment, he can take different things that don't necessarily fit together and make them somehow work perfectly in, in sync. And I think the ideal for me of a family is exactly this. We're not the same. We have a four-year-old daughter with a character very different from mine and from Andreas. She is her own person. Andreas and I are very different. But there is this possibility in the metaphorical way to have the counterpoint that we're each different but it fits together, it creates a very nice music. And more specifically, I think singing together, teaching our daughter the early music for keyboards that Bach wrote for his children. I mean, he left, like you said, um, a lot of material for education of music. So, I mean, you can study Bach all your life on all levels and it's always so, so marvelous. Thank you, Tamar. You are perfectly right. And I have a further question for you because you are a pianist and a harpsichordist. So did you approach Bach's music at the piano first and later at the harpsichord or vice versa or together? And what do you think about playing Bach at the piano? Ah. Well, <laughs> do you have one month to talk? <laughs> um, I started with the piano. Um, we had an upright piano in my bedroom when I was a child and then my older brother played the piano and so I kind of just went along and um, studied the piano as well and discovered the music of Bach this way. And um, I was not at first particularly concerned with early music performance or um, going on early, playing on early instruments, but I was just because I like the music of Bach so much, I often listen to it, and it happened that I heard performances on the organ, on the harpsichord, and I was really attracted to both, to the sounds of the organ and the harpsichord. Originally, I actually wanted then to um, learn more about the organ. This was when I was a teenager, so I was already in the Hochschule for music, and um, I thought, hmm, I will take organ as a second instrument just to understand Bach better. Unfortunately, being Israeli, the organ is not a very popular or common instrument. We don't have many churches in Tel Aviv, and there were not many people who could teach me the organ. So I dropped the idea, and it was later then that I took cembalo as a second instrument, as a default, because the organ was not possible. But then very quickly, I fell in love with the cembalo, and... Um, and it was really an eye-opener, an ear-opener to perform Bach on the harpsichord because I realized how, it, how it's meant. And then to answer your question about playing Bach on the piano, um, I love very much listening to Bach on the piano. I love playing Bach on the piano, but I'm constantly aware now that this is actually an arrangement because the chamber and the piano are similar, so the keyboard is the same, so of course you can just move from one to the other, but actually the mechanism is almost opposite. The sound is very different, it requires completely different technique and very different approach to interpretation because of that. So if I want to express a certain thing on the chamber, I will do it differently than if I want to express the same emotion or affect on the piano. I will use completely different means. And so, I think when playing Bach on the piano, one needs to be simply conscious that it's written for another instrument and that we're actually playing some kind of translation of the work where we add a lot of information that is not in the source and also vice versa, there's information in the source that cannot be uh, expressed on the piano. I believe 
that if Bach had written for the modern piano, he would simply compose differently. So just, you know, write octaves or use the pedal or just use the things that the instrument offers simply in a different way because he was such a great composer who would have made it sound its best. So that's what I think. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. That, and it's also interesting that you can play in the same time apsichord and piano so that the technique could, could manage together. Why, Mr. Scholl, you in turn, you are especially of Baroque music, but you experience very creatively the relationship with the past, perhaps also due to your activity as a composer yourself. And for example, we are very interested in your album, Small Gifts, in which you intervened fascinating on Bach's original scoring. Can you tell us the story of this recording? I think that with Bach, Bach at his time, we know when he performed the same piece again, there were constant changes in instrumentation, transpositions, changes of meters, and it all had not, it had nothing to do with that he thought now he has a better idea. But it was pragmatic ideas. He said, oh, the oboist that played the same cantata last year is not available. I rewrite it for traverso flute. And if I write it in traverso flute, it needs to be lower. It fits the instrument better. Or I have a different singer, all this. So in a way, we, we went about in, 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 in this direction. We, Dorothee Oberlinger, who's a fantastic colleague and, and, and the most amazing recorder player, uh, she suggested to do some Bach pieces and we experimented with the cantata Verknüpft Ruhe and um, there's this, this famous second movement where Bach talks about the lost souls, how, how much do I pity the lost souls and what would you God have thought about these poor creatures that lost the way to, to God. And um, so Bach withdraws the bass line. There's no bass line. It's just the viola playing individual notes. And in the original, of course, there would be two organ voices, like two, two voices, but on different manuals. So I've done the piece very often, and I always see that even the good organ players say, ah, it's awkward because we're crossing the hands. On two manuals, it would be so much easier. It was written for two manuals. And then, uh, and then we said, but, okay, maybe we, we try something with a traverso flute playing the top voice and the organ playing the lower voice. Uh, I did that with Academia Byzantina in concert a few times. With, and um, uh, so with Marcello Gatti playing the, the flute and uh, Ottavio on the... Playing on the, the apsichord organ. Yeah, on the organ. And... Um, and with Dorothea, I said, of course, she plays the recorder. So why the, the, the organ, in a way, is a simulation of the flute, depending well, if you use the, the labium pipes. And then we, we said, OK, let's try it with two flutes. And it gives, of course, a completely different uh, idea to the, to the piece. And it's not authentic. I think we can be sure that Bach never performed the piece with two recorders playing these solo voices. But to me, it is absolutely justified and it is an adaptation to the abilities of the orchestra. So if you don't have the, uh, or if you, if you have two excellent uh, recorder players, then they should play in this cantata. So this is how we kind of rearranged it. Well, I think it's a great idea to interact so creatively with Bach. And in turn, uh, Mr. Halperin, you are not only a famous performer, but also a scholar. And in your thesis, you developed a deep analysis of the use of keys and tonal plans in Bach's music. Did the idea come to you as a scholar or as a performer? And how did your research impact on your performances? Um, definitely, <clears throat> every scholarly idea that I have on Bach comes from performance because <laughs> this is my first identity and the scholarly part is just the curiosity that comes from playing the music, hearing the music and simply wanting to know more about what makes it so special. So specifically about my thesis, um, it's a pretty small simple idea that took then a lot a lot of work to, to demonstrate I, I but the idea is that um, for each key, Bach composes 
consistently in a specific way. So for C major, he uses certain musical um, parameters that are different from what he would use, for example, in D major, just for as an example. And that for each key of the 24 keys, he has a specific um, yeah, color and idea in mind of how it would sound. And so these pieces in one key have many similarities. And the idea came to me simply from playing a lot of Bach and then noticing, oh, it's again, the beginning sounds the same, or oh, there's a motive that it sounds the same like another key, and it's in the same key, and it's the same notes, it's the same meter, it's the same rhythm. So then I set out to go through all the music and show all the similarities, see that there are some exceptions, explain why the exceptions are there, do the history, why I believe this is so. So this is the whole scholarly work, but it comes from performance, and the implications that it has for me are also on performance in this way. Um, Bach does not give a lot of information outside of the notes. So he doesn't say it should be played slowly or, or loud or soft. Um, when he does that, it's in very, very few specific cases. But then, these, for example, he could put in a, a G major piece, presto. And then this G, this G major piece, um, has very many similarities with another piece that is also in G major, has the same meter, has the same rhythm, has similar melodic motives, similar, similar figurations, but it doesn't have the title presto. So when I look at the page, I say, hmm, it looks so similar. I conclude, I deduct it from the presto of the other piece, this is probably a fast piece as well. Maybe not presto, maybe not prestissimo, but it will be in the fast range. And it happens to me so often that I look at just at the score and the score kind of jumps and it says it's this key. It has all these parameters that are so similar to another piece in the same key where there's some information about the performance, about tempo, about um, um, dynamic, etc. And so I simply can have more information about these pieces than I would otherwise. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Thank you so much. And I will read and find and look for your, your dissertation. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Mr. Schull again, um, if you are not mistaken, you have recorded two more albums of Bass Cantatas. You talk, uh, you talk about your experience as a child, as a child uh, at the beginning of this coffee. But um, as an adult, what does it mean for you to engage with Bach's sacred repertoire? So to understand and to perform as a, a professional singer. I believe that uh, in the solo repertoire for specific voices like the solo cantatas for soprano, alto, tenor, bass, they are the most difficult pieces in the Baroque repertoire mm -hmm. on, on many different levels. They are challenging certainly from a technical aspect that uh, Bach writes for the human voice like for an instrument. It, there's, a, there's a different philosophy. If we look at Handel's vocal music, and we look at his biography, we know that Handel was obsessed by the human voice. He loved the human voice and he fell in love with specific singers because of the way they sang. He traveled from London to Dresden just to hear one specific castrato and then he signed him up for London. So, and Handel would always write for a voice in a way that he says, I know your weaknesses, I know your strengths. So I write something specific for that singer that brings out the voice at its best. And Bach says, uh, uh, if we were to translate this now as Bach's spoken voice, Bach says, I don't care who sings the piece and I don't make any compromises for singers. I have my idea how a piece should sound. And if you want to be the singer, or if you want to be the flutist to play this piece, you better be good enough. Otherwise, just don't, just don't <laughs> touch. You know, Handel says, Handel says, I know what your voice can do, and I avoid doing this because I know you can do other things better. And Bach says, I don't care. You, you want to sing this, you better be good enough. So if all singers know the typical, what I call the Bach breath, 
when you at the end of a phrase like you can't find space to breathe. So 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 the the final syllable of a word suddenly gets much shorter. Just to, and people do this hectic breath, which frequently ruins the calm character of a piece. So so that's one technical aspect. Secondly, Bach's music is complex also on a theological uh, level. It's, it's, you cannot pick up a Bach solo cantata or any cantata or, or a passion from Bach without knowing the context of the piece uh, and, and context in two <coughs> levels. Like, what is the purpose of a Bach cantata in the first place? It's preaching through music. There was the Sunday service, uh, in which the piece was being performed. There was the gospel, there was the priest with his sermon, and then Mr. Bach, who put the teaching onto the subconscious level through music. He, he did the same thing. He preached through music. And you need to know what you, what, what you sing about. It's certainly not music that you just pick up. You say, I speak German. Okay, these are the words. I sing the words, and that's it. And I think too frequently this is being done. And uh, teaching now in Salzburg and before that in other places too, I, I, I strongly encourage students. Now, now the last session in Salzburg that we did online was the cantata Ich habe genug. And it, and it shows that we need to engage with that piece on who am I when I sing this piece? What is my role? Am I speaking for everybody? Am I speaking just for myself? Am I talking to is it a prayer to God? Am I appealing to the community in the church? All this determines how I will look on stage, how I will behave on stage, and where I direct my vocal and my mental energy. It's like if I look into the audience and I sing, Ach, großer Gott, God most likely is not sitting in the audience. So I already made a mistake. If I, if I appeal to the community, like there's recits where the you really like a severe preacher say, Die Welt, das Sündenhaus bricht nur in Hölle nieder. So then it's like you're a preacher. And then you need to basically grab people by the collar and say, listen to me, this is important. This is the authority of Bach that's in there. And your body language, your mimics, your voice, everything needs to fulfill this purpose. And this is what makes Bach's music uh, very difficult, but also so incredibly rich that you can sing the same Bach solo cantata 200 times and you never get bored because you always discover new things and you, there is no definite, there's no final ultimate interpretation. There is whatever you think through hard work, you come today to a point where you say on the 20th of May 2020, I give you this interpretation because I think this is how it's being meant. And next year I say, well, I've changed my ideas and something different comes. And that's the, the, the fantastic uh, thing about Bach's music that makes it so difficult, but on the other hand, also so rewarding. Well, we are really enthused and we'd like to chat with you for another two or three hours. <laughs> but unfortunately, our time is uh, finishing quite soon. So uh, just a very quick uh, last question. Uh, you are an international family and a Bach family. And from your international perspective, how do you think that uh, JS Bach.it may contribute to the artistic and scholarly panorama? That's us. That's our association, the kind of uh, Italian association about Bach. <laughs> Um, well, I think anybody that becomes exposed to Bach about first his music, his story, um, yeah, the genius, everything about it is a, can become a better, the world is just a more beautiful and interesting place. So if you can help spread the beauty, then everybody benefits from it. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara and Maria. <laughs> so thanks a lot for your time, for having been uh, with us. And we hope perhaps to invite you once more for another coffee. Love um, to join. Andreas and I will perform Bach on a streaming concert. Normally we go on stage, but these are 
Corona days. So we will do a concert on the 20th of June with okay. some Bach and other early music and also some music from our latest album and some images from, since we will be streaming from our home, we also show some images of our hometown and a few other surprises. Well, yeah. of course, we'll advertise it. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And also, much. good luck for your home concert. <laughs> Thank you so much again for being here and grazie mille per tutti gli ascoltatori che continuano a seguirci e grazie ancora una volta ad Andreas Scholl e Tamar Halperin per essere stati qua con noi e per aver bevuto questo fantastico caffè insieme. Grazie. Grazie. grazie.